the book of Proverbs chapter 14, verse 13. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. All right, I want to give all praises, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem, Rachakwadash. Yahweh is the true name of the Heavenly Father in the Holy Tongue. Yahweh Shai is the true name of the High Priest and Savior of Israel. And Rachakwadash is the Holy Spirit, which is the Comforter. Double honest, the apostles and elders of Great Millstone for leading by example in these last days. And Shalom to the hopeful elect, all you Akian making your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, through the Spirit, the name of this lesson is Nothing is Good Enough. And this is the, the spirit that the men of the Lord are in, the men that actually believe in the scriptures and the kingdom of heaven. Once you believe in Yahweh Shai's resurrection and you believe that this current world we're in is going to be destroyed, anything other than total salvation is not good enough. There are no victories in this kingdom that are going to satiate you or make you feel like, oh, this is, this is good. This is good enough. There, there's no, there's nothing here for our people, especially if you believe in the scriptures, because you know what's coming to us. You know what we're entitled to. You know what was promised to us by the Heavenly Father and His only begotten Son. So every every moment that you enjoy in captivity, it ultimately leads back to sorrow. It ultimately leads back to, to heaviness. Let me read this again. This is Proverbs chapter 14, verse 13. It says, even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful and the end of that mirth is heaviness. So, you know, you might spend time with brothers or even your family that's not, you know, necessarily in the truth, but they don't hinder you from doing the truth. You you have certain moments where you get to enjoy, you know, company of your loved ones. And then you start thinking like, man, how much better would this be in the kingdom? Or you have a, a so-called great day. You know, you wake up, you you pray, you, you know, you do a lesson, you you work out, you, you do something that's as productive as possible in this kingdom, you know, whether it's the Shabbat or, you know, a particular day where you just, you're not in slavery, but you, you get a lot done. And at the end of the day, you accomplish a little here, a little there, but then you, you start to think, man, if this was the kingdom, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to do this at all. It would just, when you think about the kingdom and then you live in this, this hellhole, there's a constant heaviness, no matter what you go through, no matter what type of uh, victory you obtain here, there's still heaviness because we're not done yet. We still have work to do and Yahweh Shai still has to come back and physically deliver us. That's why, you know, when you look at King Solomon, right? When you let's get that real quick. This is uh the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter one. And yeah, I'll start at seventeen. It says, And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this is also vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. And that's exactly what happens when you come into the truth. You increase in knowledge, and then you increase in sorrow. You know, certain jakes, really most of us, before we came into the truth, we might have been uh, watching certain videos, so-called conspiracy theories, or so-called red pill videos, or, you know, truth videos. You At the end of the day, you have certain men that come across the truth that weren't looking for it at all, and then you have men that were seeking the truth, but didn't know what the truth was. And once you come into the actual truth, the full truth, which is that you people of so-called Negro and Native Indian descent, you're the 12 tribes of Israel. You literally descend from holy men that made a covenant with the Heavenly Father. And you, you're you going to reap those promises. That's that's a beautiful thing to find out. But it, as the scripture says, when you, you know, the, the scriptures are like honey, you know, it's sweet and then it's bitter. It's bitter to find out that you have all these things promised, but you have to stay here. You have to dwell here with, with these degenerates. You have to be surrounded by, you know, your own people that still don't know who they are, even though they see the prophets, they see certain things on YouTube, social media. They know that they're Israelites, but they don't know what that means. You know, the majority of Jake's, they've heard that term by now and they know they know who we are. They know that so-called Jesus Christ is a, a so-called Negro. They know these things, but they don't know the gravity of it. They don't know the... The promises that they have coming to them. They don't know that they're supposed to live according to righteousness in the scriptures. They don't know these things. And it's vexing. It's vexing. The, the more you learn about these elites, the more you learn about how this society was created and how, you know, the plans of these elites and how the majority of our people are going to fall for it, it's, it's sorrowful. Okay. It makes your heart heavy, but we have a, we have a greater promise that we have to keep our eyes single towards. Now, while I'm in, in Ecclesiastes, let me get this in the next chapter. Because this chapter goes into King Solomon, of course, having, you know, he had his own band. He had servants and maids. He he was the, the richest man on earth. And, you know, he his conclusion was, 
you know, this, let me read this real quick. This is uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 9. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. It says, and whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. And there was no profit under the sun. So imagine having trillions of dollars. We can't fully quantify what King Solomon had because there was no Federal Reserve. There was no U.S. dollar. OK, if you were to take, you know, someone who owns the known world. All right. Every every kingdom, every nation, they brought tribute to King Solomon. So he was he was richer than Mansa Musa. He was richer than the Rothschilds. He was he owned the known world at that time. And he not only did he uh, prosper financially he also profit profited spiritually okay he prayed for understanding and really he prayed for the holy spirit and the most high delivered it to him he he was a master in in botany psychology anything you could think of he was the wisest man on earth okay not just physically not just uh with with tangible riches but he was the the wisest man he was the richest spiritually and his conclusion was what all is vanity and vexation of spirit because once you have true understanding of the scriptures you know that the kingdom of heaven is the only kingdom that's going to be eternal. It's the only kingdom that's going to last. King Solomon knew that his kingdom was temporary. So that means what? That means everything that he did, all of his labor was in vain. He knew that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. So imagine being the king of Israel in Jerusalem, knowing that every single thing you do is about to be destroyed anyway. That's why he said it's vanity and vexation of spirit. When you come into the truth, you know, no matter whether you get a promotion at your job, no matter whether you have a, a children, a beautiful family, no matter, you know, if you you win a, a bet, you know, Jake, you know, be gambling during the spreads, you know, whatever, whatever type of victory you have in Babylon the Great, you know that if you're in the truth, whatever you, you have is going to be destroyed. OK, you get a new house, a new car, you get a new house, you get a new family, whatever it is, is going to be destroyed. OK, now certain brothers, families obviously are going to be saved, but, you know, their flesh is going to be destroyed. And in, in other words, all of your your uh, your labor towards building anything up in this society, you're not going to take it with you. Even brothers that get delivered with their whole family, you're not they're not going to be delivered in their current state. OK, you're not going to have you're not going to walk into the kingdom looking like you do now. It's all vanity. This is everything we're doing here is like uh what was that, Groundhog's Day with Bill Murray? He just kept reliving the same day over and over again until he got it right. And every day, when you see the same thing over and over again, you become like a god because you can predict every single thing that's going to happen. Okay, at 1147, this guy's going to wreck his car. At 314, this woman's going to walk into this cafe and say this. Like, he just saw the same day over and over again, and it was just vexation. He got increasingly depressed, and he was just, he'd seen it all. And that's how we feel. We've, we've been on this earth uh, incarnation after incarnation, we've seen everything, you know, come and go. And you just, all you want is the kingdom. You want this current, this loop that we're stuck on. You want it to end so that we can, we can reap the benefits of the kingdom of heaven. So King Solomon here, again, when you read this chapter, just read how much he had, man. He, he had pools in his house. He had a live band following him around. And he said, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Now, the only thing that's going to make the sorrow go away is the kingdom. It even tells you in Isaiah that the, the sorrow is going to flee. Let me get this real quick. This is the book of Isaiah, chapter 35, verse 10. It says, And the ransomed of Yahweh shall return. And this is talking about the elect, the remnant of the nation of Israel. Okay, there's a remnant of Israelites that are going to hearken unto this word and return to Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai. It says, And the ransomed of Yahweh shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So sorrow and sighing is going to flee away. There's not going to be any more tears. There's not going to be any, any pain in the kingdom. We're not going to be disappointed in anything. Everything you put your hand to do is going to be done. And that's the exact opposite of this place. So, you know, going back to Revelation 21, it tells you that he's going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. All right, that that doesn't happen here. There's, there's certain laughter that, you know, will make you... Uh, experience joy for a moment but then after that mirth is heaviness okay so that's why it says here they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away there's not going to be sorrow and sighing in the kingdom there's not even going to be a moment where you feel bad or you know 
Jake, sometimes you'll be down in the spirit. You got to pray for, you know, pray to endure. All right. In the kingdom of heaven, you're not going to have to pray to endure. You're not going to ask the father to put the spirit on you to go through this hardship or this tribulation. It's just going to be endless victory, one one victory after another. And we're going to it's going to be the first time in history that the 144,000 are going to increase in knowledge, but not in sorrow. All right. In the kingdom, we're going to increase in knowledge every single day. We're going to learn more about the Heavenly Father's creation. We're going to grow as leaders, as kings and priests, but we're not going to increase in sorrow. Here, the more you you learn, the more you're, you're like, man, that's how that works? There's really only two things you could do with wisdom here. You can you learn how something works and then you, you're still at the bottom. You can't execute proper judgment, so it's frustrating. Or you learn how something works and wickedness and you just become... You can't execute judgment against the heathen. So it's like, okay, I learn. For example, you might have a hobby where you learn, you know, certain mechanical things, or you you get into the herbs. You learn how this herb affects this illness. You learn how this, you know, situation could be remedied. But you you're still in a situation where you can't really execute that. You you can't just open up a pharmacy and just sell a bunch of herbs. That you know, Jake tries to do that, then they get locked up. All right, because we're not here. To, to benefit. We're not here to prosper. We're here to be slaves and ser serve out our captivity, serve out our punishment so that we can be delivered out of this. And just knowing that means every type of, of so-called victory that you have here is temporary. And, you know, that's, it's bittersweet. Okay. Again, there's a, there's a sweetness of honey when you come into the truth. And then there's a bitterness that sets in like, man, this is, this is it, man. This is, I, I got to go through this. All right. This is a, this is our sentence and we have to deal with it. But again, in Revelation 21, let me just let me just read it instead of referencing it. This is Revelation 21. I'll start at verse 2. It says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from the Most High, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And that's talking about the 144,000, the church, all right, that nation of kings and priests. We're going to come down from the chariots after we're delivered from that destruction. It says, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Yahweh is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and the Most High himself shall be with them, and be their power. And the Most High shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And that's what we look forward to. We look forward to the day when, when all pain is passed away. We don't look forward to any like many victories here, you know, certain, you know, there's certain things you, you plan. Obviously you don't go through, through life. You know, I'm an Israelite. I could just, you know, not have any plans, not have a job. That's, that's not what we teach. That's not what the doctrine is about, but it's about putting things in proper perspective, which means knowing that everything we build here is temporary. And there's a, there's a, a mourning that comes with that. All right. It tells you, uh, going back to Ecclesiastes, it's better to go into the house of mourning than into the house of mirth and feasting. You can't, you can't become made a sharp threshing instrument by being happy all the time. You can't become a, a proper judge, a prudent man, if you're just a, a fool that's just laughing at everything all day. Your countenance changes with this truth. This truth changes who you are as a man. It changes your view of yourself, your view of your brother, and your view of the world. And what does that do? It, it puts a heavy spirit on you, which is what you need to become a proper judge. So don't shy away from these things. You know, this lesson is not to... Uh, Make brothers feel like, woe is me. You know, there's a there's an end to all of this. There's a, a perfect end to all of the, the pain and trauma that we go through. It's actually making us into gods. It's making us into proper judges that know both good and evil. Um, let me let me end with this real quick. This is the book of James, chapter four, and verse seven. It says, Submit yourselves therefore to the most high, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to the Most High, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn. Weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Now, why would, a, why would an apostle write a letter to the church, which again, James has written to the 12 tribes of Israel. Let's get that real quick. We can't bring this out enough because people are playing games like they don't know what it is. This is James, a servant of the Most High and of the Lord, Yahweh Shai Mashiach, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. Okay, that's who the Bible is written to. That's who the epistles are written to. That's who the uh, the 144,000 is. That's the, the all tongues and kindreds. 
that are being drawn. Okay, it's the 12 tribes which are scattered. It's not talking about heathen. But getting back into verse 4, it says, Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. So he's writing a church, exhorting them to be more heavy, to be more mournful. Why? Because that's the spirit that's going to that's gonna sharpen you. That's the spirit that's going to uh, build your countenance. And let me get that in Ecclesiastes. Instead of just paraphrasing it, I'll just read it. This is Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and I'll start at verse 2. It says, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Why is that? Verse 3, Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. Let me read that again. Ecclesiastes 7 and 3, Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of the fools is in the house of mirth. So you see here it says sadness is better than laughter because sorrow is actually what purifies you. All right, Being repentant, being low to the earth, which is what the word humble means. It goes back to hummus, which means low to the ground. So if you're in the spirit of mirth all the time, how are you being made better? How are you, how are you being sharpened? How is your countenance changing? If you're just walking around, you know, Jake had that that just sickening you see these, a lot of these young jakes they think everything is a joke these tiktok jakes they just have that look like man the lord's about to kill them they just look so unmotivated to do anything serious jake think everything is a joke you can see the lord's not dealing with these people so you know if you're going through something just keep in mind the lord is actually working on you he's actually preparing you for for what's to come which is pure darkness destruction the day of the lord is not going to be a day for joking and laughing so Get used to, uh, you know, become acquainted with grief, all right, like it says about our Lord and Savior and what Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. You need to become acquainted with these things. So when it happens, when the deal goes down, you'll be prepared. You'll be in the right spirit and you'll have the right countenance. So Abaratazah, this lesson was edifying to the elect. I want to give all praises, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem, Rechach, Wadash, double honors to the apostles and elders of Great Millstone, and Shalom to the whole elect.